Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, so my name is Roman. I, I'll be talking about server side with Colin Curtin. So I work. I did lots of things in the past. Uh, now I work for JetBrains. Uh, that's a company behind uh, uh, IDE. Uh, you, you, you might have heard of. That's called IntelliJ IDEA. And we're also doing a language called Kotlin. And my talk today is going to be about Kotlin. Uh, but it's going to be based on my prior experience. I mean, because in the past life, I've been doing lots of enterprise backend development in Java. So I've been Java programming for more than 15 years. And that's kind of lots of what I do now is kind of reflection of that problems, of that experience of my, my past time. Uh, but here's, let's get acquainted a little bit. So who of you uh, actually uses Kotlin as their programming language? Uh, who her knows about Kotlin? Okay, good. Uh, so, so Kotlin is uh, this programming language for lots of things in general purpose programming language. You can do uh, program at service at GVM, you can do Android, you can do uh, code for browser, for native. I'm not going to talk about all of that, uh, but this talk is going to be like mostly focused on server-side Kotlin applications. So, uh, that's, just, that's just the topic of this talk. But let's uh, first reflect a bit on how we, uh, you know, programmed our server-side code in the past. So what happened like 2000s when I started programming. So in, in 2000s when I started programming, so we had this old school client server monolith application. So we had uh, clients that called a server. A server usually had like a bunch of executor threads to handle like various business logic. And at the back end, we usually had a database. That was kind of general data flow in the typical, typical server of 2000s. And you know, whenever a request from the client came, it was assigned to one of the threads. And uh, you know, usually the thread did some logic, went to database, uh, worked for a while, then returned response. All fine. And when we wanted to cite this application to configure it, it was easy. Uh, the rule of thumb we used is that we simply configured as many threads and applications as there are database connections because most th things threads did at that time, they were going to database. So it's really easy to configure, really easy to scale. Like if you scale, you scale your database uh, so that it can support more connections. You scale your service, you increase number of instances. was pretty straightforward until the time services appeared. So that was started 2000 something, uh, you know, in addition to database uh, that we used to have, uh, we started to have additional services for authentication, uh, for, you know, various additional configuration storage and applications started growing and started, you know, fragmenting, fragmenting. And over time we ended up with applications where everything that server talked to is some kind of another service. A database itself became just one yet another service. We, like this old architecture of application and database turned into the service oriented architecture where your application talks to lots and lots of services. And in this new world, you know, how do you configure it? How do you size it? That's become a complex story. And complex story became because the logic we usually writing enterprise is complex. Uh, so here we're in Chicago, and the things I worked on for, for my life was writing different trading applications. So let's take an example that you're writing trading applications. So you might, might be having some function in your application to place an order. And it might have, uh, you know, to ask one service to load account information about this order. And then depending on some condition, may not always, but depending on some logic, it may go to some other service, you know, to load some margin configuration for this account. And then it might have to do some local computation for it, compute something that might be CPU intensive or not. And this is just small groups of what complex business logic might look like. In practice, you know, the applications we wrote, they had thousands of lines of logic in a single method. You know, call stacks could be, you know, 10, 20 methods deep and it would, con on different conditions, con con contact all the different kinds of services, go to different databases to aggregate this information, return the answer to the end user. 
So, and what happens then if just one of those services becomes slow, like for example this one? We may not even call it on every code path. We may be only call it under some conditions. But what happens if it's slow, for example? It doesn't have to die. Maybe it was misconfigured, you know, somebody deployed a new release and uh, it became much slower, couldn't handle the load nowadays. So what happens is that in the traditional architecture where there is a call to the service, the thread that executes the call gets blocked. It sits there waiting for response. And now if another call comes in, you know, and happens to touch the service and the service is slow, it gets blocked too. And over time, you can quickly end up with all your executor threads being blocked because just one of your services is slow. And you may not even use the service on every code path. You know, your application could have handled other users who do different kinds of requests who, that don't require this particular service. But what you ended up with, uh, your whole application blocked, you know, uh, your uh, customer calls, uh, wakes up everybody, you know, everybody works frantically to figure out the problem, fix it. You get this cascading failure, one slow service in your code, and you get cascading failure throughout your whole enterprise. Like everything starts falling down like dominoes, just because one slow service somewhere. And what we see here is an example of modern code and the code that waits. You see, in, because of the service-oriented architecture of nowadays applications, what we have now is that most of our code does not spend its time uh, actually consuming CPU, actually doing some work. M our modern code, our modern service code, what it does most of the time, it just waits. It just waits for response for some other service to do something. That's what happens nowadays in our code. And there is a solution to this problem. There is a solution how you write these kinds of applications so they scale. Solutions called asynchronous programming. It's been known, you know, for, for ages as a solution to writing this kind of code that waits. So the solution that uh, asynchronous programming tells us is that instead of blocking a thread while you wait, uh, let's actually release the thread and wait without blocking the thread. Let's Let's let it work and let our threads do something else. And whenever this slow service responds, let's then wake up, find a thread to process the result of this service and then return response. But it looks nice on a picture on this diagram, really, this about how you achieve it in practice. And there are multiple ways to achieve it in practice. See the, uh, the it, instead of like regular function that uh, does something, uh, you either use callbacks. So for example, uh, you uh, add a parameter uh, to your function that will get called when the answer is ready. That's a way to unblock the thread, you know, and then only, uh, only use it back when the answer is ready. You can use futures or promises as they called, you know, and wrap your result type in a future. Uh, nowadays, it's popular to also use reactive programming, which is kind of a variant of the same theme. You use a type like Mono. Who of you uh, watched uh, the talk from yesterday about reactive Spring? Well, lots of you, though. So that was the, the topic, basically. That talk was uh, how you program with those reactive types, right? So you uh, change your, all your functions to return this Mono. Uh, for example, that so instead of returning one result, you return the mono of result, and and then you program with it. Uh, but programming with it is not very pretty because you know, like the, your code gets these combinations. It's, it's becoming hard to read. So people uh, are always looking for other uh, solutions to this problem. So for example, some languages uh, propose this async await paradigm, which uh, also f based on futures. Uh, which are async await called tasks. For example, in C sharp they call task, or in J uh, JavaScript they called uh, promise. But async await lets you, you know, lets you program in a more uh, natural way than uh, uh, without like lots of those combinators and stuff. And Kotlin coroutines follows a simple model uh, through the thing called suspend functions, which lets you like write your 
functions naturally without any futures. You just add suspend modifier to indicate that function can suspend. And this talk is not going to be in particular about the suspend mechanism. So we're going to be on scaling server side. So if you're really interested in figuring, in learning more about all those different paradigms for asynchronous programming. So I really welcome you to uh, watch one of my other talks, either Introduction to Coroutines from Kotlin Conf. Uh, uh, the talk I recently did on Go to Copenhagen, which was like introductory, you know, how this all works. So that's kind of will fill the gap you know, on low level details of what, what's going on with different programs, et cetera. And we'll get back to server side applications. Uh, but before we go back, we'll still need to one thing, little thing to understand. For those of you who don't know how it works behind the scenes, what's suspending functions in Kotlin, it's worth understanding at least a little bit that behind the scenes, every suspending function is actually transformed to a function with a callback. So uh, whenever a compiler sees this suspend modifier, it actually adds a special callback parameter. And uh, the question is then, why so? Why is it callback based? Why is it not based, for example, on futures? Because nowadays futures uh, is, or variant of them, like reactive programs, is the most popular approach to asynchronous programming that's used in the world. You know, other programming languages do it, like C Sharp does it, uh, JavaScript does it, and uh, uh, for example, reactive programming is also future based. So why then Kotlin compiler is not future based, but callback based? There are multiple reasons to that. So key reason, and for service side, that's very important, which is performance. Uh, that's we also discussed before the start that nobody cares about, but still, since we're general purpose, you know, a programming language, we have to care even for those, you know, fraction of people who, who uh, care about performance. So but see, future is synchronization primitive. When you talk about programming with futures, uh, future is something that synchronizes two processes going concurrently. One process is promises to deliver a value in the future, the other waits for it. And because of the synchronization that's required for futures, a future is always has a cost. So whenever program with futures, it's always a cost. And on the, but on the other hand, the callback that Kotlin compiler is, is a low level primitive. It's not synchronization, it's just low level thing. If you look at every futures library, futures and promises there, it's actually always built on top of callback. So in every uh, for example, reactive library, there is a function you can call up subscribe, get a callback to it, it will, you'll get called. Or in completable future in Java, uh, you can uh, ask it to install a callback, get notified when operation completes. So callbacks are, there's always a callback behind. Callback is more low level. So, so when we integrated a feature into the language, it makes sense to use the low level mechanism, not the high level, because you can then build high level things on top of them. And because we're using callbacks, it makes it very easy for Kotlin code to integrate with whatever asynchronous I.O. library you're using. Especially in JVM world, and we're talking about JVM, there are lots of lots of uh, libraries available uh, for asynchronous I.O. There are low-level asynchronous I.O. library, like Netty, for example. Uh, there are high-level asynchronous library that lets you do HTTP, other stuff asynchronously. And they all support callbacks. You can ask any of those libraries give the, it a callback and it calls you back when operation is ready. So because Kotlin coroutines are, and suspend functions are callback based, you know, we can, if we, for example, implement, for example, this load margin function might be based on somebody else's asynchronous library. And we can easily integrate it. We just uh, implement it as suspend coroutine call and that gives us a callback we should invoke when operation is ready. So now we can write our integration code inside of there uh, to invoke callback when the operation is ready. So if somebody gave us third party library, here's a library that does this asynchronously, uh, we can quickly, easily integrate it and represent to the rest of code as suspending function. So now the rest of code doesn't need to care how to install callback, it just calls uh, load margin and uh, that suspends and resumes when operation is ready. But then, how it works at scale in the larger application. So like not individual function, but the application itself. So let's take, it to, like, uh, take a look at our picture. So call comes from the clients, you know, threads allocated, starts to do something, but then we have to release a thread somehow. So how this might work. You see if, uh, let's take a look at the server framework we're using. Like for example, we're using Spring 
or with some using some in-house framework for writing our server-side application, or maybe J2E, something else. Uh, so there is our top-level function, place order. That's the operation for our clients to invoke. If all we can give to our framework is this function to place an order, there's no way we can release a threat because just the very signature, the way it's invoked, tells like it has to return a response. It cannot return a promise to response. It cannot say, I'll please wait. You know, there's no way for it to release a threat. It, its signature tells, you know, here is an order, give me a response. So, so it has to block a threat if, you know, it has to wait for something. There's no way around it. So in order to be asynchronous, uh, you know, our framework has to support some asynchrony. For example, it, ha it sh should support for maybe reactive programming, maybe like a modern Spring, it, you can write your functions as returning a mana or completable future or some way uh, to say that no response is not immediately available, it will be available later. Uh, even better, uh, you see the, with mana, uh, then uh, we can, if we have a response from cache, uh, we can we, we should we will be wrapping it, uh, you know, in mana dot just invocation. So that's a way to tell. Oh, here's I have a response from cache. Return it. So even better if our uh, framework actually supports suspending function, uh, because if our place order is suspending function, then the code inside it looks natural, like return a response. I just write return. I didn't have to do like this wrapping combinators and stuff. Uh, and fortunately, again, uh, uh, support for suspending function is coming to frameworks near you. Spring uh, 5.2 is going to natively support suspending function. So you won't have to do it by itself. You can just write suspending function and take it whatever you get or get it associated with URL, you know, place appropriate annotations for Spring. It will just work. So there's nothing. but. It's maybe you have some other framework that doesn't support it, or maybe you want it now, or in current versions when that does not yet support suspending functions. So what do you do? But if it does support some asynchrony, you can always adapt to it. For example, if your framework supports reactive, then you can use a thing called Carotin Builder that lets you transform uh, a code with carotins that you write inside to some asynchronous type that the code expects outside. So for example, this mono function returns a reactive monotype, and if your framework supports them, that's okay. If your framework supports completely future, you can use a future builder. So for every asynchronous type there is, it's easy or it's usually out of the box adapter. And as long as your server supports some asynchrony, you can adapt it to coroutines. But the key point is your Server frame has to support asynchrony. If it does not support asynchrony, if it's synchronous, you, 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 uh, there is no way around it. I mean, you end, will end up blocking threads and unnecessarily harming your scalability of application. So the starting point to get in this new brave asynchronous world is to get an application server or server framework that supports asynchrony in any way. And then what, it doesn't matter what way it is, you'll be able to adapt and then use it. And once you adapt it to it, once you're in this world of cloud and coroutines with suspending function, then everything else becomes simple. Because inside suspending function, you can just write regular code. Like you wrote before, uh, you can invoke other suspending function naturally. You don't need this, I mean, if you can see the reactive spring slide, uh, you don't need this then many, you know, and all this crap because it's, it's like you don't need to blot your actual business logic. You just write it like the usual way you read before. Uh, and that's, that's the beauty. That's, that's kind of the main selling point of Kotlin currencies. You just write your usual business logic. And the other thing about suspending function, it's actually efficient. So if we look at more, a simpler example, because simpler example is easier to represent in an alternative way. So uh, there is just two, no, uh, no you know, conditions, just uh, a couple of a synchronous call to some services, uh, suspending function from performance standpoint gets you only one object allocated while it executes. The object is actually needed for Coroutine's machinery uh, to save the state of your uh, call when it's suspended so that it can be restored when it's resumed. Uh, 
If we were to write the same code with traditional approaches, like with the reactive, for example, it would look something like this. First of all, the logic completely obscured because you'll have this flat map, map calls that completely obscures what's actually going on. But then it's also way less efficient because now you have uh, this lambda in curl basis that has to be allocated. You have the resulting future that has to be allocated. You have another lambda allocated. You have another resulting future allocated. So you have a, at least four objects just for two calls. Yeah, once what suspended function did you with one. Uh, well, uh, people who are fans of this kind of programming style, which it's hard, I find hard to be a fan of because like, I can't see what's going on here. But they'll say, but yeah, you know, in some cases like there, uh, I'm actually placing order, I'm doing some quick preconditions, and then I'm calling some function to actually place an order. And they say, no, you see how efficient it is because I just delegate uh, to another function that returns a monophony, and I just, you know, pass back up. So no extra allocations, no extra anything. See how quick and convenient it is. <laughs> but the answer is that, in fact, you know, if we write it with coroutines, uh, the same code, it will look exactly the same just for suspend modifier different return types. It turns out the, when you get it to Kotlin compiler, it also compiles it efficiently because tail calls in suspending function actually compiled without any allocations, just like, like it was uh, with uh, future types. So it's just as efficient due to this tail call optimization in Kotlin compiler. So you never lose anything and programming with Kotlin coroutines is always more efficient than any other approach uh, you'd find. And so what happens when you actually execute the code, like in your typical application? So it all starts somewhere in the top, you either manually or the framework for you invokes a Caroutine builder, so request comes in, Caroutine gets started. You get this execution context, your operation. Then some, for example, place order gets called, that's your call stack, then you know, it delegates maybe to actual place order, then it does some more logic, then it uh, invokes some service to load margin, for example. And then, for example, this is a synchronous operation. So it invokes a spend coroutine and installs a callback. At this point of time, all this state of your call stack gets saved in heap and the actual Java stack unrolls and returns. So your thread is now is free to do anything else. Like it's not busy waiting, it's not blocked waiting for response. You know, all there is is pointer to the continuation to the callback in the heap that waits until whatever IO framework you use there that calls it, you know, here is an answer. In this case, that gets restored from whatever place it left. So that, that what makes it efficient. You are not blocking thread, which is a very expensive object, lots of memory. Uh, and you can have lots of them uh, while you're waiting uh, for a response. So how you actually scale then your application with Caroutine? So how this answers the original problem, like how do you configure your service? So uh, let's take a look. So you have your clients calling, uh, you have still have executed threads to actually run the code, but then you have some a synchronous IO framework that has some service threads. Because every, you know, the code still runs on threads. If you're using whatever NetT or devil library, it still needs some threads. It doesn't need as many threads. Uh, the, the beauty of a synchronous IO framework is that if you're using synchronous input-output, uh, like to support 1,000 connections, you would need 1,000 threads. To support 10,000 connections, you'll need 10,000 threads. With asynchronous, uh, you can, easily have 10,000 connections just in a single thread or in a few threads. So you'll configure those service threads depending on the requirements and scale and uh, whatever uh, recommendations your uh, IO framework gives you. But then, so that depends on just what IO stack you use. But then these threads that you execute your code, they never get blocked. Whenever they have to wait, they release and take another. So they only execute CPU intensive code. So which means there's no reason to have uh, more number of them than number of CPU cores in your system. So it's very, it becomes very easy to configure. You just you know, use default configuration, which is the number of CPU cores in your system. That's it. Uh, and that way your system works at maximum efficiency. You know, it doesn't waste extra threads. It doesn't try to overload system with too many threads. It all becomes efficient. 
the practice though is more complicated because what if you have to do blocking IO? And it happens, you know, uh, first of all, the code might be out of your control. Uh, somebody just gave you a third party library. Here is, you know, to load account, here is a jar, call this function. It will load account for you. Yeah, it will block a thread for 10 minutes maybe, you know, that's your problem, you know, we don't care. We're another department in the company. You know, it's your problem to scale your application. Here is a jar, you use it, you know. That happens in, in enterprise, you know. And, uh, or maybe, you know, just legacy. Maybe it's your code, but you don't have time to rewrite it right now. It's written in this, you know, old Java style blocking way. Uh, so what do you do? Now, just if you just end suspend modifier to your function, it doesn't help. Because suspend modifier, it enables the function to release. It doesn't make it asynchronous, you know. It enables this feature where it can, you know, suspend and then resume later. Unless you write some code that actually does it, 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 there's no change in behavior of the function by adding suspend modifier. What you can do though, if you can say inside of a place, you can say with context and give us some other thread pool to execute, which is called uh, dispatcher and Kotlin coroutines well. This with context function is actually what suspends execution. It actually passes the task to execute this code into another thread pool and then uh, suspends uh, this operation until that other thread's done with the work, then it resumes. And this dispatcher, you, you, you use your regular Java API, you create new thread pool of some size, uh, you use extension function called as current in dispatcher to convert it to dispatcher, that's it. And now it's up to you how many threads to allocate to this particular operation. So you can say, okay, because I know this, I'm not loading that accounts. It's not like a heavy operation in my code. I'm not loading that many accounts. I maybe allocate just 10 threads to it. But then you know if something goes wrong there, if your load account is slow, all it can do, it can block those 10 threads. It can block the rest of your threads. The rest of your can still execute code, then uh, may not need to load accounts at all. So that way you isolate it, uh, the, any, whatever performance or reliability or scalability problems you had with this particular API, you've isolated them in, and not just isolated, you've encapsulated them inside this load account function. Now the rest of your code now doesn't have to care. Uh, for the rest of your code, just suspending function that would not block a, a color thread. Now the same story with CPU bound code. If you have some heavy computation in your code that might run complex algorithm, that might consume a lot of CPU, the same story. You use with context, create a separate thread pool for those C CPU heavy operations. And again, while it consumes CPU, it consumes them in a separate thread pool that you size separately. So now your whole sizing story becomes like this. So you have executor thread that executes some quick code that does not, you know, so you, your application can churn client requests without delays. And then you have a separate thread pool for your asynchronous operation that your some asynchronous IO framework uses. You have a separate thread pool for some blocking operations or maybe several of those. And you have a thread pool for your CPU bound operation. You size them depending on the needs and then you get applications that's always responsive uh, that can continue executing client requests despite uh, something that may slow it down or some failure somewhere in the backend system. And that's really, that what, what, when I was an enterprise developer, uh, but back in 2010, writing in Java, that what I was missing. I mean, we've had those production incidents, like every year we had some big audits just because some one server, you know, is slow. And there's little we could do. Because writing this, I mean, we could have, I mean, there's no magic behind, it's just jungling threads around. But if you're writing it like in plain Java, it either means like we're writing it with uh, something like, you know, futures and then mangling all your business logic and turning all your business logic into this unreadable chain of then many, you know, and all these combinators that, you know, they, you become more, I mean, that's where, you know, you boilerplate your, choreography like completely overwhelms the, the, the whole logic you're trying to express. And we're being, you know, enterprise developers, logic for us is everything. Like we debug, we cared about, you know, we wanted, we needed, that's the logic that was we, all our work was about. So we couldn't really solve these problems before 
in Java, but in Kotlin using coroutines, they're easy to solve without app screen or making for you harder to work with the logic of your code. And you know, because the main executive threads, this way never blocked. They churn, they always process responses. But there's more than that uh, than just uh, being able not to block your main thread pool. You, the Kotlin coroutines also naturally support cancellation. And what cancellation mean? Why would you need a cancellation in an enterprise application? So your typical use case is timeouts. So maybe this place order, I mean, just has a timeout of one second. And in this open half in business, some operations just don't make sense if they take too long, especially like a trading area. If it took us too long to process it, I mean, maybe uh, market moved. We don't want this operation anymore. We should just cancel it. So why are we still wasting resources on it if uh, you know it's, uh, we know too much time passed? And again, before cartoons, it was a pain to manage it. Now all I, we have to do is to wrap with special with timeout block. And uh, whenever one second elapses, uh, the code inside it gets canceled. It doesn't matter how complex it is, how deep the call stack is, it doesn't matter. If uh, every operation inside the callback will know what the timeout is. And for example, if my load margin is this asynchronous operation that installs a callback, all I have to do to make it cancelable is just to replace suspend coroutine with suspend cancelable coroutine. And then I can install uh, this invoke and cancellation callback uh, to cancel whatever, because every you know, async of from usually they, they have a cancel method. You can ask it to cancel operation. And this, by the way, usually the difference between blocking IO, for example, if you do blocking I, uh, socket read, there's no way you can cancel it. It's usually like you read and that is blocked until data is available. Uh, and that's a big difference in asynchronous frameworks because all the asynchronous IO frameworks, they give you this ability to cancel it. That's just because the way they're structured. And then you can naturally integrate it with cancellation and coroutines framework. And that works then transparently to the programmer. The other advantage that coroutines give you is that it becomes very easy to plug concurrency where you need it. What do I mean by concurrency? What where you might need concurrency. So let's take a look at this again, simplified example, but slightly different flavor of example. What if to place an order, I need to contact two services, a or a margin server, but in a way that there is no data dependencies between those calls. So, I mean, I could do them concurrently because I don't need to know the result in this particular example, unlike the previous one. I don't have to know what the first call returns, uh, to call the second one. So there is no need to wait for first before calling the second. I can do both calls concurrently. And with coroutines, it becomes really easy to express this concurrency. All I do is I would, I would then invoke some asynchronous operations concurrently. In the future, in the, for example, my futures programming world, or with, if, if I were programming with futures or with async await, I would write them a synchronous function that returns some kind of a future. So, and so instead of waiting for operation, I'd say start this operation, you know, and return me a future as a promise that you deliver a result. And then what I would do, I'd say now let's wait until results. That's a typical, you know, programming of concurrency uh, with in the futures world. The problem with this approach though is that if my first operation fails while I'm waiting for it, this one. So I waited for it, but it fails, returns me an error, exception, or network connection timeout, whatever, too, took too long time. Then my second operation is still working because I've started it, I've received a pointer to its future result, but it's not complete yet. So this, my place order function returns, but my margin service operation still works in background. Now, because I failed, you know, my cost client code might retry, might do it again, and might fail again. So again, I have another margin service load operation that leaks. And again, a big enterprise, enterprise application, that's, that's a hell of a scenario. Because again, similar problem. One of my services failed, my load account service. It's suddenly, I get this cascading failure across the system, where suddenly, operations starts leaking across the system. Now everything works, it doesn't 
uh, it doesn't like break immediately, but even worse, like in 10, 15 minutes, I start getting out of memories, too many connections on other services, what's going on there? It's really hard to troubleshoot when the code is written this way. The way coroutines help here is called structured concurrency. It's a way to do concurrency in your code in a safe way that is not uh, prone to any leaks or lost resources. And the way it's achieved, there's a special function called coroutine scope that you wrap, that you scope all your concurrency in. That's, that's kind of a bracket around uh, all concurrent operations in implementation of your function. And then inside this scope, you can do async as a, which means execute this concurrently. Async is this function that gives you a future. So just like before, uh, it gives you a promise to deliver the result of whatever called inside the curly braces. But the difference, and you use it the same way, you await for the results. So it's very similar, but there's one important difference. In the, if this fails, because all of it happens in the scope, the scope gets canceled on a, any failure of any concurrent operation. And the cancellation of the cancels all the child operations, all the concurrently executing operations inside of it. So moreover, the scope waits for completion of all children. So it won't terminate until everything gets not just cancel signal set to it, but until you know, it all actually shuts down, releases all resources that were occupied by those operations. So when this placeholder function returns uh, with an error because one of its sub-operations failed, you know, there's nothing leaks. There's no resources that are left behind. And you can safely try it and make sure, you know, you know that nothing, there are no leftovers from a previous attempt. But it's not enough to give people tools for structure in their concurrency. Uh, I mean, if you uh, do some tools to write code in the right way, but there are some other ways to, you know, where, um, but I mean, if, but if you can write it simpler in a way that is not right, chances are in a big organization, big project, lots of code will not be written in the right way. And that, that happens in Java programming a lot. Like uh, in, in my world, we had lots of those rules. You know, you have to structure code this way because we've kind of learned hard way many of those rules. You should do this, you shouldn't do this. If you do this, then your application will fail in two years in a row and you'll spend sleepless nights trying to figure out what's going on. So we get all those rules, what you should or shouldn't do, but actually enforcing them was kind of a tenuous task. You also have to write link check, uh, you have to review, you have to remember not to forget to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we in Caroutines enforce this? It's actually quite easily enforced because if you accidentally to forget uh, to break it, uh, your concurrency with Caroutine scope and just uh, write it like this, let's do these operations concurrently, this code will simply not compile. It will say, oh, there's no async. What does it mean? Uh, what's the magic behind it? There's no magic actually, simply because a sync function in Kotlin Curate is defined as an extension function on Curate and scope object. Unless you have it, you can't uh, call it. So there's no risk of uh, you accidentally forgetting to scope your concurrency. You simply can't do any concurrency unless you define what's the scope of your concurrent operations, what, 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 what the larger operations that contain them. And we have this, it's not just one function sync, it's a convention. Whenever uh, we write a piece of code that creates a coroutine in the ground, we define it as an extension function of coroutine scope. And that convention gives us, like, it works better than documentation because, like, I only have to look at signature of a function. They know that this function has this side effect. It launches a coroutine, so be careful, you know. Uh, it has to be called in a scope because otherwise if uh, this background operation that it launched will leak, you know, and may leave uh, resources uh, and launches the other curtain builder that also just fires and forgets a background operation. So in our case, we use types as a help in documentation. So whenever, whenever in Kotlin I see a function a regular function with some parameters and result, I know by convention that it should be some fast 
local operation that maybe looks in cache, you know, does some quick computation, quick logic. If I see a suspending function in my business code base, I immediately know it's some operation that may be slow, does some heavy computation, goes some remote service. So type itself tells me what to expect from it, whether it might take a long time or might not. And if I see a function that extension on Cartesian scope, I know that this operation has a side effect of launching a background process. So now, having these types, they not only serve as documentation, but types are enforced. What does it mean? Enforced in the way that from, for example, suspending function, which are slow, I can easily call a regular function. That's okay, they're fast. But I can do reverse. I, from a regular function that should be fast, compiler will simply not let me call suspending function, which is good because like if this function should not be calling slow function, which is, or remote function. But it, I can actually from my fast function create a coroutine. But if I do this, I will have to be explicit about the scope. What the scope of this remote operation? Because this function require coroutine scope. Uh, and then programmer who invokes it has to think what scope of this background. Is it the scope of this function? Is it the scope of my request? Is it in the scope of the whole application? And usually like well-structured application have different scopes uh, that uh, bracket you know, different activities. And from background function, from inside of it, I can easily call suspending function because I launched a separate background process. I can now go and do uh, long running uh, requests uh, to other services. That's how types are enforced, so they, they're better than documentation. It's not, I mean, I, do, I don't have to mention this in the documentation. Compiler enforces it for me. And, you know, for any function, I can call this one if just using Cartesian scope. But there, that's not the only way. I mean, it's, it's a good point to then compare this approach to alternative approaches. And alternative approaches, for example, are green threads and fibers. Uh, who have you heard about uh, project Loom in, uh, in Java? Yeah, that's, uh, the, by the way, there was a presentation yesterday about Java Future, it was mentioned, I think. Uh, so that's, that's the approach that Java works on to bring asynchrony to the Java world. And it's also exists in, in other systems. For example, in Go, you have these green threads. And if you look, so how does this work and how it compares to a synchronous program that Kotlin gives you? Uh, with green threads or fibers, all the programmer gets, uh, programmer gets these fibers, these lightweight threads. That, uh, and that's a kind of analogous to coroutines in our world. And they are backed by, by the threads. But the threads are hidden from developer. They're not directly accessible. So all you get in green threads model, you get these lightweight threads, and then they're backed by a uh, small number of executed threads. That looks really similar it's to programming one of those coroutines. You can have lots of coroutines that suspend and resume on this small pool of threads. So fibers promise you, you know, that you develop just like threads, you, everything is effectively suspendable. You can, from any function, you can call anything. And that's both strength, you know, of the green uh, threads model, but it's its weakness because you, you don't have type system helping you structure application. Like with Scotland coroutines, you know, you have to mark uh, your function that takes slow long run operation with suspend and at scale at large enterprise, that pays off because it lets you enforce the structure. It pr protects you from accidentally going long run service from a function that was supposed to look up quickly in a cache. You see, that's, so at a scale, the type system helps you like any other type system. That's like a difference between dynamic programming engine and static. But here is one disadvantage of the coroutines model is that when you start programming with coroutines, you end up with this situation. One executing threads, lots of other thread pool. And now you end up in a situation where the execution has to switch between threads often. You know, it runs here, then does something, goes to another thread. So solution for this is instead of having sep separate thread pools, use a shared thread pool. So in, uh, when the thread blocks there, we can create a new threads, but only as needed. 
when thread blocks here, we can remember that it was blocked and create a new one as needed, and etc. And actually, Kotlin coroutines already has this ability. Be here, instead of creating uh, your own thread pools, you can use built-in things like dispatchers.io that actually share thread pools with, de with a default executor. So switching from one to another, it just mental operation doesn't actually switch a thread. It's the code still runs in the same thread, but when the threads become blocked, it creates new threads on demand so that you always have the number of threads you configured to run your CPU intensive code. Uh, the, the, let's try to quickly, so we're running out of time, so I'll be quick and covering now how you work with streams of data in coroutines. So what we've seen so far, we've seen how you work with single responses. You can, you can also write a function like this that returns a list, which is a great way to represent like REST APIs. Like you make HTTP requests, you get a list of items. That's a great signature to represent it. Here is a list. You wait once, return listed once. But there, it's becoming popular to write APIs, like again, on the, uh, uh, on the talk yesterday, you might have heard about AirSocket. That's a protocol where you're streaming. Or WebSocket, for example. It's a protocol where it returns many events, but it doesn't return them at once. You get a stream. And you might want to start processing them as soon as they arrive. So what type you use here? You can't use a list, because a list is like you get it all at once, and only then you can start work with it. So what, what do you do here if you want to stream responses? One thing you can use as a channel is the channel is this communication primitive for coroutines. You send data on one side, receive on the other. So what you can do is you can say, here's an example. You can say, OK, let's uh, produce data with the produce builder. And you know, that produce builder returns a type of a channel that you can receive from. And inside Produce Builder, you can you know, uh, do any asynchronous code. You can wait, you can do. And ultimately, what you do is you send elements to this channel. And then on receiving side, you can easily use a for loop to receive all the data from channel and print them. So that lets you ability to transfer streams of data in a synchronous way and start processing them as soon as they're available. This is actually a good concept, could be used, lots of people like it. For example, uh, Go language is all about channels. Like it's, this approach like really popular, being popularized recently by Go language, like structured system as, you know, coroutines interacting through channels. Like you can go talks and go conferences, they, lots of talks how to structure code using channels. But th uh, there is a catch with this approach. Uh, the catch is that the function that creates a channel has to be ex in Kotlin with structure and has to be extension of coroutine scope because it, by our convention, because it creates a coroutine that produces those elements, a synchronous process that is producing elements. Uh, which, which is okay unless you try to do something like this. Unless you start this full function and f lose the channel to turn to you and not receive from it. If you did that, the coroutine that producing is stuck. It's trying to send you, but there's no one on the other side receiving. And with structured concurrency, this code just hunks because every scope in Kotlin coroutines waits for completion of all the background processes because we don't want them to leak. So you get hung code here, which is bad. It's, it, it makes it harder to write like complex logic. You cannot, if something received data, if something else not received data, uh, you get stuck here. So there's an alternative solution then uh, based on Kotlin flows, which are currently in previews. It's the concept real similar to channel, but in different in one crucial way. And similar is the sense you write it similar. You define your data, but instead of producing, you say, here's a flow of data. Here's I'm emitting elements asynchronously. The difference is, is that uh, flow is like kind of a synchronous sequence, uh, meaning that it's Cold. It, it won't actually start doing any code unless you ask it to do it. So you use it with, instead of for loop, you use it like with function called collect. So you, you tell it, okay, I want to collect data from you. And only this 
when you ask it to collect, the code starts and starts producing the data and emitting it to the consumer. So this way, if I just invoke this bar function but don't use result in any way, you see nothing happens because flow did not even start. There's nothing to lose, no resources open, no connection established, there's nothing. Uh, and the other good thing about flow, you can efficiently apply transformation to it. Like you can map result filter, and if you're familiar with regular programming, with if you learn how to program collections and content, you learned sequences, you learned all those transformations, there is the same with flows. There's, you don't have to learn any new language, you don't have to learn new set of operations, you just work with your flows just as you would have worked with your collections. It feels and looks really natural for any Kotlin programmer. So that's it, that's our general promise. You know, uh, we want you to write asynchronous code in the same way as you write the rest of your code. It should not look differently, it shouldn't require you lots of new knowledge. That's it. <laughs>